meeting. Um, it's approximately, I can't see the clock, but about 4.05, 4.10, no, 4.05. 4.01. 4.01, oh, geez. Um, time flies. Um, uh, call to order, everyone is present. We do have a few citizens here as well, so thank you for joining us. And we have also, for the record, we have our town manager, Tom Hall, and our, um, I just drew a blank and I can't remember. I know I remember who, I just like, have yeah, those moments. And Ruth Porter, <laughs> our finance director. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, today's agenda is a little bit light, um, but we wanted to make sure that once the budget, basically once the budget passed, uh, to continue our work on the other areas of finance within the town, as well as uh, maybe have a wrap-up conversation around the budget. So uh, with that, uh, moving on to item number three, approval of the minutes for May 13th, 2005. So moved. Second. Any uh, adjustments needed or everything's okay? Um, all in favor? It's unanimous. Moving on to item number four, discussion on fiscal year 2016's municipal budget reduction recommendations from the town manager. Just as an overview, um, and I do want to apologize. I usually, if I forgot, I usually open it up to public comment at the beginning, but I will definitely have that at the end if anyone wishes just to speak. Um, for those, uh, for a recap, particularly those who are watching, what it was approved as part of the budget um, approval at the council level was that we made an adjustment of $180,000 asking the town manager, on the municipal side, asking the town manager to go in and make those adjustments that would allow us to balance out the full budget um, based upon what we had received as feedback from citizens and referendum questions. And so the conversation today is focused on that $180,000 reduction. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the manager. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Babine. Uh, yes, with the directive given uh, by the council as part of the, the final budget compromise, um, I approached this task first by calculating kind of the proportional share uh, and, and bring that back to a monetary target for each department. Uh, that was the starting point, and uh, I was certainly expecting to see, and I did see, I believe, almost every department meeting that um, that financial or monetary target I set for them. Um, I, I then re reviewed those proposed changes, consulted with Ruth and some others, and overrode a number of them because I thought they were kind of short-sighted in, in simply making the budget goal without, and, and potentially doing some harm uh, in future years. So we were able to find additional savings elsewhere, and, and in the end came up to the targeted 180,000. In two departments in particular, I just want to flag for your, your attention, though we don't expect really any service impact because uh, many of these delays were going to be expected through an extended recruitment and hiring process. Uh, but in police and fire, much of the savings are gained through um, kind of, I'll say delays, if you will. Essentially, we were budgeted for full 12 months of salary in certain positions, and we know that's not going to happen. And in most years, uh, well, this happens every year, and what happens inevitably is that becomes year-end balance, if you will. So in those two departments, we've, we've reached the target by those means. Uh, I'm pleased to say in all other departments, uh, we've been able to do it without, with other um, uh, reductions in their budgets. Um, so the effect of that uh, is certainly we meet the near-term budget goal, but the full annualized cost will be reflected in the 17, you know, FY17 numbers. So that's something I'm well aware of, and that will be a challenge uh, you know, in day one as we sit down and do the fiscal year 17 budget. Um, beyond that, just a couple of general comments. You know, this was not an easy task. Uh, we didn't, and we didn't take the easy route. Uh, we could have hit some of the big uh, accounts and, and made up most of this, if not all, like winter sand and done it, you know, restored those stocks over a couple of budget cycles. Um, and I'm pleased to say that we're able to avoid that uh, in large measure. And, and that really is a testament to my staff in terms of taking what was a already uh, fairly lean budget and, and uh, squeezing out additional savings. So this is kind of a new starting point for us, and, and it will set the benchmark and the challenge even greater for us going forward. So I'm pleased to go through these in detail, uh, but I, I guess I offered them to you as a package. And uh, the condition, or excuse me, the amendment that the council passed that brings us to this uh, conversation uh, directed me to identify them and for the finance committee to approve them. And that's what uh, I would ask of you this evening. And just to compliment that, my goal as chair would be to then report to the council as part of our regular meeting 
these adjustments that we approve so that they can see those as well. Um, and, and with your action, Ruth will make the final uh, adjustments and uh, establish the chart of accounts for fiscal year 16. Questions from the manager for Ruth? Yeah, I, I guess I guess Tom, the, the question I'd have is, especially as as you describe fire and police, which are sort of public safety issues. I mean, is everybody comfortable that this will not impact or has a minimal impact on those issues? Yes, I can say specifically, and I can provide you the source documents yeah. from both yeah. both chiefs. Uh, with the police department, due to it. A, a, some other internal matters, they weren't going to be able to bring someone on till a certain date in the future. So we would have been living with that um, that vacancy anyhow, frankly. Okay. Uh, yeah. And in, in the fire department, um, the chief was very interested in maintaining his two new firefighter staff members and, and keeping them at April 1st, again, to minimize the impact of fiscal year 17. Um, and was able, because I think he's got some more abilities with per diem and, and whatnot uh, to, to gain the savings uh, without surface impact. So I'm comfortable in, in what's before you. Okay. <clears throat> Tom, nice to hear that the, uh, the case that was made by the fire chief for the two new positions, that mm -hmm. we can hold that. I, I thought he had endured enough uh, of uh, delays on that since he had made a very strong case for it for two years in a row. Uh, all of these, uh, this page here mm -hmm. shows it's, the allocation was a percentage of budget. Was that the way? Initially, pretty much most of it is. Pretty much. A, uh, and then each department head was given the responsibility of identifying the most appropriate way to pair off uh, the amount allocated to his his or her department. Correct. Yep. Uh, and you've had a chance to go over with each department head their comfort and satisfaction with, yes. the, with the judgments, and, and you didn't have any reason to, to question them after you had a chance to talk with them? No, not at all. Uh, you know, this has been very scrutinized in, in great detail. So. Um, uh, you know, I, I sit before you comfortably offering these up as something we can live with. And as I said, it does it does set a new starting point um, for us going forward. Um, two, two things that I wanted to mention. One was um, I think it is what's the word um, in a way ironic that we're focused um, a significant portion, eighty ninety thousand dollars. <coughs> is related, well, even more than that, is related to really a reduction in um, job-related expenses, primarily salaries, uh, overtime, whatever it might be in those categories, at a time when, um, I know this Wednesday, we're talking about um, some citizens wanting uh, increased patrols or enforcement of ordinances down at Higgins Beach, or whether it's piping plovers or wherever it might be, but yeah, we're talking about reducing overtime and reducing uh, things that would support that. So um, we're obviously um, constantly challenged by um, somewhat um, conflicting demands of our community. So mm -hmm. I think it's kind of important to recognize that. The other piece is that um, for myself personally, um, and I mentioned this uh, to someone earlier, you know, when we combine with the school department, our total budget is $73 million. And I think that in this uh, type of uh, arena, which is really what they call a policy governance model, you know, Tom is, Tom is hired to manage this type of adjustment unless it violates, for me, unless it violates one of our goals as a council. Um, and significantly it would, here it would be, you know, we wanted to maintain and not have to uh, release any employees and none of this impacts any of the goals that we've set. So I'm very happy with the adjustments that were made. I um, can support them completely and without any questions. So I'm very happy with it. Okay. Yeah, as am I. So um, I would recommend, um, I, I would move approval of the manager's recommendations for the $180,000 in adjustments based upon the line items that were provided. Second. 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 Comments? No, I think the, uh, I agree with your comments that it was very much within the responsibility of the town manager and the department heads to do it in a way that was most effective 
of their management of their departments. And it seems like that's what's happened, and it's a good outcome. So I, I support it. And I guess the only thing I'd add is I just thank the leadership stepping up. This is it's not easy to make these types of adjustments, and you know they they did step up. That met what we needed to do as a town. But I think that takes tremendous leadership and really complement that process. So thank thank your team. I, I think this is a remarkable sort of stepping up to the plate to do what we need to do. So thank you. Yeah, I really view this, and, and I hope it's a theme that goes forward and it takes everyone to buy into it, is that we're all in this together. And if uh, if, if it requires us to, to assist to get to a certain point, th then that's what we need to do. And, and I would expect that all others involved in the process uh, view it the same way. Yeah, it's a great start and a great model. So hopefully I'm trying to lead by we'll, example. Yes, we'll have yeah. some follow ship. So thank you. Let's hope so. Um, all those in favor? <coughs> Unanimous. Thank you. Thanks. And um, Tom, if you can do me a favor for mm -hmm. Wednesday's meeting, you print off a copy Sorry. of this so I present it as part of the finance committee yeah. report, please. Um, next item, item number five, is a discussion on legal and audit services and our policy. Um, as a high-level um, review, and uh, I'm going to uh, ask Tom to, and Ruth to kind of uh, make sure I'm being honest about this. I believe the town charter says that every three years, we're required to, in essence, put out an RFP, they use different language, for at least uh, for auditing services. Um, and um, I believe that um, the, what has happened in the past, even though legal services isn't necessarily part of that directive from the charter, it's always a good thing to kind of combine the two because uh, they're very important services to the town. Um, I'm not 100% certain if uh, we're legally required on the legal services side, but I think that there's a general consensus in the community as well as the council that we do that. Um, with that, um, Tom, do you want to sure. kind of give us a high level on that? Yeah, if you don't mind, I, I, I never want to point out, uh, say a counselor's wrong, but you've got it slightly, okay. slightly different. Uh, the charter speaks to the annual appointment of an independent auditor. As a practical matter, from a contract point of view, the council has approved some multi-year contracts with, with uh, vendors, uh, and that's in fact the case. Uh, we're wrapping up a three-year contract uh, right now with our current auditing firm. Uh, as regards legal services, the charter is silent, other than the fact that it recognizes that there is and shall be a um, town attorney appointed by the council. It really doesn't talk about a um, uh, term. However, there is a council policy that speaks to it, and it says, and I'll paraphrase, it will be the policy of the Finance Committee to evaluate legal services every three years and determine if an RFP is warranted. So it's not necessarily required, but it's just a check-in. And during my tenure, I can honestly say that's never occurred. This policy has never been respected in terms of a three-year check-in. Um, just as a, a final overall comment, both of these relationships um, are highly important. Um, you know, it's a professional relationship. Perhaps the legal more so than auditors, um, having kind of that institutional connection ends up being very important. Um, not many things are brand new coming in front of council. Um, sometimes there are some new issues, but having that institutional knowledge is of great value. And I think that speaks uh, to the fact that we've been with the same firm for over 30 years. I think a lot of that has to do with that um, that idea behind it. Auditing services, you might you might suggest, because you really want independent, fresh eyes. Uh, it's not a bad thing to have uh, new folks coming in looking at the books. Uh, I say that, and uh, Ruth's probably cringing a bit because her relationship with the auditors, uh, you know, is is very important, uh, just in terms of the type of information they want, when they want it, um, and we've been very pleased uh, with our current auditors. So uh, I'm pleased to um, expand further on, on either of these issues. Perhaps I could get some feedback from you first. Yeah. Um, can you remember? Is it Woodward and Curran? That's our uh, legal. Who's our current? No, Bernstein, sure. Bernstein, oh, that's right. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Matt Page, right? For yes. Okay. Uh, I guess the question I have is, um, so um, just to be the uh, the technicality, so it does state to evaluate every three years. When was the last time the council or finance committee evaluated them? I'm not aware that they, the during my tenure, that, they, that there's ever been this formal evaluation. Okay. They did do it when uh, the prior manager was here. I'm not sure that they actually went out to bid, though. For I, legal uh, services, I mean. I suspect they did it around 2002 when this policy was adopted. <laughs> and perhaps I was on the council. I just don't remember. Mm -hmm. um, 
No, actually, 2002, I was not. September 2002, I was not. It was two months later. Um, well, so the, I guess um, if it's the will of the, the committee, um, I would actually recommend um, in order to move this, we should probably at least get an evaluation done, mm -hmm. which to me I would ask the manager and his staff to provide us to, to work with uh, the legal, um, our legal uh, to provide some type of an evaluation and overview that provides the details of the relationship as well as the amount of work completed, the cost of it. You know, whatever, um, I would take your guys' advice on what you'd like. I mean, you're actually the former attorney, so um, I would take advice on what you think would be appropriate in an evaluation so that we could then receive it. Uh, yeah, I, I would, I agree with having an evaluation done. Uh, I think a long-term relationship with your legal counsel is valuable because of the institutional knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that you do need to be able to have discussions with them about giving uh, uh, appropriate pricing to an institutional client like uh, the town of Scarborough, and uh, that's that's an important discussion, so, the, so that we can always consider ourselves as getting as good a value mm -hmm. for the legal services yeah. we obtain as as anyone in a similar position. And I think so from a finance point of view, I think the question for me is to be effective and efficient uh, and value oriented in the receipt of our legal services, as opposed to going for the least expensive lawyer who might, whose the value of that service might be, uh, you know, so much lower. So. Uh, I, Bernstein Shore has a fabulous reputation. Yep. They have the breadth of legal knowledge because we have lots of specialty questions. I think I must have dealt with, uh, in the two years, five or six different people. Right. Right. Uh, you know, whether coastal issues or zoning issues or finance. Uh, uh, so it, you can't go with a small, a small shop and expect to be able to get right. uh, sophisticated analysis. Interestingly, I'll just give you a quick little um, background on the history, and, and Bill, you can attest to this, um, I'm sure. Chris Vandiotis was our longtime, in yeah. fact, he may have been with us since the beginning, and he retired. He's still off counsel with the firm, but we don't really have any interaction with him probably four years ago. But um, during his tenure, uh, he was the face of Bernstein Shore. They certainly had other partners and associates to help. Uh, but uh, Paul Frinsko did some of the financial stuff. You might have dealt with him in the past. But when Paul and, and uh, Chris left, um, they reorganized their municipal practice entirely. And so there's five or six people. We have one point person, but there's five or six people, depending on the speciality, uh, that will chime in, whether it's real estate or zoning and land use and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's just the way of the future. Um, everything is so sophisticated and complicated and specialized that um, I think that's an understandable format. And so uh, Bill's exactly right that the days are gone where you can have kind of a jack of all trades. You can have someone that's a good municipal lawyer and a generalist, but our needs are really far more sophisticated than that at this point. And, and there's probably eight or ten fir firms in Maine. And I get to do something part. for those attorneys. We have more than we really need. Right? <laughs> <laughs> There's, but, but there are other qualified firms that could certainly satisfy our needs as well. Yeah. And I guess I'd be in a slightly different place, only from coming from sort of a corporate environment where it's almost mandated by the boards, where if we really haven't done an RFP in recent years, and it sounds like we really haven't done a formal RFP where we define what it is we expect, what services we want, when do we want the product delivered. I know one of the issues is, you know, our, our audit report is usually about six months out. I know other firms are delivering audit reports within a three-month window, and I think the sooner we get the data, the better. I think I think it's it would be due diligence on our part to do an RFP process. All these things we just talked about are part of the evaluation that you get afterwards. But but if we do an evaluation of just our existing partners, we're kind of doing it in the vacuum. We really don't know how you how that compares to the marketplace. So I I think it's due diligence, and especially sort of the process we've been through. I think it's time we do an RFP and, and get our folks in here. I know when Hannaford did RFPs, even the incumbents um, upped their game and made it really changed. Once you get, it changes the financial picture, 
um, when there's competition, the cost of the audit came dramatically down. Um, and they provided additional services because other firms were willing to compete on those services. So I, I sure. think all those conversations we just had will be part of our evaluation process, and, and I agree with the institutional knowledge. And I think there is a difference maybe between legal and audit, but I, I, I don't see the harm of getting some other information to the table, talk to others, and really benchmark the marketplace and then make a really good due diligence decision about who our partner should be. So I think there's two questions here, and um, they should be split, at least in my, in my view. The first is I 100% um, agree with Peter regarding audit services. In fact, I don't think that there needs to be a re-evaluation done prior to actually requesting an RFP, because I think the evaluation comes after you get the RFP, in which our staff will provide us an evaluation of, of them and determine what are the best services for the town based upon the cost. With legal services, I'll agree with Bill, I do think long-term relationships are very important when it comes to this particular type of service, um, especially having served since 2002, in which, you know, I'm not speaking out of turn, I know that um, all three of us have been at least threatened to be named in a lawsuit uh, with one um, public speaker. Um, I've personally been named in, a, um, in a, a suit against the town in which I was protected, and so I think that the services, and by, I'm not the only one, but um, <laughs> it wasn't really anything important. Um, so, you know, I, I understand that service, and I think that's where the evaluation should come before determining whether we want to then do an RFP. So I think there's a mix between the two on that. Um, not sure how you, you know, balance uh, that with what you uh, I mean, the point Peter makes, uh, I mean, a valid point that sometimes RFPs do bring out the best possible proposal. Uh, uh, I guess what I, and, and from an audit point of view, I think that probably is the correct thing to do. I think on the legal side, I'd probably just turn the order around and see how we felt about the outcome of our discussions with uh, our present council, knowing that we can do an RFP if we chose to do so uh, if those discussions weren't satisfactory. So that would that so, yeah, and, and from uh, you know the RFP, we last went up to RFP for auditing services in 2008, and they've, they've used MacPage ever since. The council's considered and, and reappointed them okay. in multi-year contracts. So we have a very good RFP template, and mm -hmm. I can I can draw from colleagues as well. Legal services is a little more difficult to uh, because the audit is their statutory and GFOA requirements in terms of what needs to be produced, the deliverable. Legal services is a, is a is a little much more difficult to get your arms around. So I I, I really like what I heard from Bill that I think perhaps a, a meeting and I would encourage the meeting to involve the finance committee with our current council, um, one or two of them. There's a managing partner and and the lead person. Uh, I think would be very appropriate. Um, and all I'm suggesting. So I agree. And all I'm asking for is an evaluation or some type of written communication that explains the relationship and what it has, has entailed in advance so I can understand that, so I can be knowledgeable to ask the right questions at that meeting. Yeah, That's because none of us know sort of right. the, the nitty-gritty details of what arrangements do we have right. for uh, yeah. charges and retainers. And and it's not just about money. It's about the right relationship too so it's it's about everything that they've provided in services so yeah because it would it, I mean, money is important of course but but a synopsis yeah. of the people who handle different yeah. elements of the relationship if I can get whatever it is as long as it's, you know um, I don't need to have a hundred page document but you know several pages that kind of explain all the areas that they touch with us that would be great. Mm -hmm. right. 80 to 90 would be okay. yeah <laughs> Sure. As long as you're throwing graphs and a couple tables, <laughs> I think you're as long as a banker again. And, and Tom, I'd, add, I'd request on that sort of, on the nuts and bolts sort of the arrangement, but also, especially on the legal side, what is the process for getting some type of performance, metrics, feedback? How do we evaluate how they're doing? And I don't know if we have a process by which we We don't have the evaluative uh, a tool that I, that I have really available. Um, I can certainly offer you my observations and opinions and I fear that at the end of the day that's probably what's going to be based on yeah. how the experience has been but again I'd like you know as much as sort of the conversations we've been having the more sort of as sure. with you as a town manager we kind of set up here are some goals we want for the year and then there's mm -hmm. a process to kind of check in and or not but I suspect with the, with the legal side 
I mean, we probably know what some of the issues facing the town are and whether or not we could at least set up some type of feedback review process if it's not in place. So I, I'd like to just think about a process that each year, who is the right parties to sit down with our legal counsel to try to do that check-in to say, how are we doing? Mm -hmm. Tom, does uh, the main Municipal Association ever uh, kind of uh, try to uh, inform its membership on best practices and their relationship with outside counsel? I wonder. Uh, I'm sure they have some work on that. I mean, because they, I'm, I'm just thinking along the lines of what Peter's saying is, you know, are, are there ways to measure that we're just not aware of, but the city of Portland oh, has made progress in that area so that we could learn from others, and that's why I think the Municipal Association might be the best place to go, although you have uh, a, uh, an organization where you talk amongst sure. managers so yeah I'll put this out on the listserv and see if I can that listserv it. might be useful yeah the, the auditing RFPs are not a dime a dozen but they're much easier to come by um, I, my hunch is that most towns have long-standing relationships with individuals or firms uh, and, and they and don't change much it's that I I see in in philosophically I agree with Peter I just don't know if it exists yeah, in practice in in the world of municipal relationships with their with their lawyers i'll find out yeah yep. one of the things that i found out recently well not that recently i guess but uh, we had some legal issues on some issue that came up and we found that we couldn't use bernstein shore because they had a client Conflict so it's i don't know what the term is but so we had to go to an outside firm to get that so you know i think the longer we're with a, a, a legal firm, the, the better our chances are of having that legal company firm, you know, represent us yeah. as opposed to having to go out to a, a different one. And I'm wondering if we went with a new firm, not that I have any problem with going out for an RFP, is do we become a secondary so we're always having to go to a different firm, you know, to, mm -hmm. to do yeah, our stuff? Yeah, there's no question our longstanding relationship, um, we get preference when it comes to these sorts of questions, but yep. inevitably there are times where there are clients older than us and, and the firm's conflicted and we have to get outside counsel and because done well with that. There, when you have new clients, and there's a new client list in these firms of this size that is circulated every week uh, to every lawyer. And so if, if you identify a potential conflict, mm -hmm. then you immediately have to get back to the attorney who's assigned that responsibility of uh, overseeing and supervising new client, the acceptance of new clients. And, and so there is oftentimes some battling that goes on as to how conflicts would be resolved. And generally speaking, the clients who are there as existing clients get the preferential treatment. Right. So maybe as part of that evaluation or that you know, written evaluation, if they can include synopsis of that type of conflict or that type of uh, situation and if we've run into that if it uh, poses a problem going forward or in the past that, that could be part of the evaluation so to, to move this forward um, it seems that we're in agreement that we want to take up the issue first of all both issues legal and audit services um, would it be wise to ask um, Ruth and Tom to come back to us with an outline of the process for receiving the evaluation on maybe both, and then um, the RFP process, at least uh, to begin with, with the audit services, because that's required, mm -hmm. um, and then have that available. Yeah. I don't know, I mean, the next item is about our future meetings, but maybe at the next meeting, depending on, on what yeah. that is, and if it's but, yeah, we you know, can suitable do that for the time, time for the next one. Okay. Do, you, do you want an evaluation of the current auditors, or do, you, or do we just want to go out to bid? I mean, uh, I'm perfectly uh, okay enough. with currently going out to bid because okay. it's required by charter. There right. is, okay. We can evaluate the RFPs, which they will probably submit as part of that, mm -hmm. and we'll include Oops. that in the discussion. Yep. Good. As part of and as part of that RFP, I'm not sure where it fits, but um, we may have a template. A tem template? Is that what template? template? Um, but we may also want to think if there's some other additional asks that we want to ask, and one that's of interest to me is really trying to speed up the time frame of between when the financial year ends and when we see the documents is one. Six months to me is, is a long window. 
um, used to more of a three month kind of window, three to four month. Yeah. And then two, also some conversations around are our documents that we're getting as easily to use as some of the other documents. And I know as part of the process, some people have looked at some of the audit reports for like Cape Elizabeth and other towns, and they seem to have a clearer, more understandable format. So there's some, some question, or so I don't know how we explore what we want to ask for in the RFP. But those two are two things that timing for me and readability or understandability of our documents for the general public to be able to pick it up and determine what's really happening to the finances of the town. And I think there's some good models out there that we can reference. So that may be a different workshop. It may be a different process. But before yeah. going to market, we should be clear about what we're asking for to have all of them, you know, and maybe in that ask whoever we're going to send it to bid to provide some different formats of the type of reports that they do back to the to the town and to the council and mm -hmm. every party. Yeah, part of the delay, just so you know, um, has to do with Ruth and her staff. Um, and, and it's also cost savings. We try to do uh, much of the pickup work ourselves, a lot of the reconciliation so they don't have to. And yeah. It costs us less. So there's a trade-off there. If we want it sooner, we put some pressures on Ruth and her staff, and it might cost us a little more, but that's cost something. because they would be doing more of the work. Yeah, we so, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean it, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be good to understand how much is their internal, because I, I work for McPage for a while, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times they also have scheduling issues with clients. So if they have a big volume at that time frame, it delays their sure. you know, process. So it'd be, it'd be good to understand how much of it is our timing under our control that we want versus how much are they dictating by their by their schedules. And if we it's did. their schedule, yeah. we should ask for something different. We did ask them to push the audit forward two month, two weeks, excuse me, so that they're here towards the end of November instead of the 1st of December. And uh, th they had to do a lot of adjusting yeah, just to make that two month, two week adjustment. Right. Yeah. So you mean when they're in the building doing the audit? Correct. Okay. But they did say as we get things done, to just, you know, ins instead of them coming in, what, which is what we started doing, is to start emailing it to them so they have it ahead of time. Yeah. Although we've done that in the past, and they keep asking us for the same stuff anyway. So, right. you know. Everyone's on the same so, cycle, time yeah. cycle. So yeah, I, that's the problem. Yeah, so I just want to um, um, <clears throat> reiterate a couple of things. One is, um, if, I, if I'm hearing this right, and Peter, tell me if I'm not. Uh, as part of the RFP for the auditing services, if they could provide a template for how the, or best practices on how to present the budget to the public. Um, to me, that sounds like what you're asking for. And the reason is that when we compare to other communities, the fact is, is that our budget presentation is done by employees and people who decipher information from the actual audit. It's not something that's created as well as, so you brought up Cape Elizabeth. Cape Elizabeth's budget presentation isn't done by auditors and it's not a template. It's something that their manager and their finance director created. So, I want to make sure that we're not adding services that we don't normally get, um, unless that's the will of the, uh, the council and this committee. Well, uh, all audits should um, have contain the same the basic stuff. financial reports right. in the same format. They're dictated by a lot of the GFOA and, and well, statute. What I'm talking about, if you, if you go to Cape Elizabeth's website, because I believe me, enough people have referenced it, it's not something that their auditors presented. It's something that their manager put together. So it's a stylistic issue between managers. It's mm -hmm. not something that was presented by a paid, well, it's paid, but by a consultant or by an outside service. So I just want to make sure that I understand what you're. Yeah, and I think, and I'll, I'll have to go check, because so, yeah. I think there are two issues. I think you're absolutely spot on when it comes to the budget process. A lot of the feedback we got, that, that their budget process, it was more like what Tom prepared for us. Yeah. For at a very high level, you could easily see. But I. I've also heard, and I'll go check, that the financial statements that are available to the public that are produced by okay, auditors yeah. um, have some type of executive summary that makes it easier for the layperson who doesn't have an accounting. I mean, our, our audited statements are very detailed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it yeah, was, so like, it was, like, okay. it was like this Thank thick. You. But I think there was a way that what, what I heard as comments from some folks that looked at it, that there was sort of a high-level executive overview sure. where the average person could say, hey, we're in good shape yeah. or not in good shape, or yeah. here's a concern. So I agree. It's just, yeah. it's just, I just want to make sure I understand. Thank it's you. The, the, the front section of the audit is the management discussion and analysis. It's probably 20 pages, and it's yeah. there that things can be customized. The back end of it is, is kind of routine. It's all the numbers, same reports. Right. Right. Not that I want Scarborough to be like 
tape, but if it's a good example and good reference, then let's go ahead and look at it. And then part of it is whether or not they've, and I don't know if they do or not, you know, for example, CAPE might not have the uh, comprehensive annual financial review award that the town gets, and there's specific things that you need to have in there, which helps to make it a lot thicker. Um, but, but, but I think if the RFP, I mean, because I've responded to them, if you put in there, our interest is to have the documents that we need for the pure financial right. services aspect, but also a document that might be able to be produced that is clearer to the average person. And do they have any examples of that? And mm -hmm. there may be a differentiator between them, or there may not be, but it would be something we've heard about, people have requested, so it sure. doesn't hurt to ask. They can, no. they can say, sure. nope, this is the cut and dry, this is what we do, or... So the second item I wanted to um, emphasize was that I agree with Peter regarding the audit because by charter we're supposed to complete the audit within 90 days, which we do. Right. It's the presentation of the audit afterwards that becomes um, less valuable over time because really you need to have that mm. to be able to then begin really the discussions around the budget because that's actual performance and it's finalized and it's right. you know another set of eyes. So getting that done earlier does help. Um, especially as we uh, get into longer budget seasons, um, evaluation process with the budget season. Um, the secondary item that I wanted to add around audit services, if we can include in the RFP request, is that we've talked a little bit in the past, and there seemed to be a desire to have trend reporting using uh, specific financial ratios that might be applicable to the municipality. Um, it might, because we've always talked about wanting a budget analyst but not having the money for it to be able to do it internally, this might be something that they would be able to create fairly easy and then even provide um, comparable data or, or analysis where it compares us to other communities or whatever, you know, I think the word that was used this past year was the cohort. You know, we compare ourselves to, um, you know, similar communities of the same size. And what I say about trend analysis, that's, you know, looking at current ratio, liquidity, capital, receivables, excise, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and have a, that part mm -hmm. of the services as well. I think that would be a good trend. Yeah, they do have a statistical yeah. section at the end. It's uh, probably pretty boilerplate with the just, you know, I here's remember. the year, here's the numbers, but yeah. I think we can jazz that up a little bit to show graphs and things. Yeah, I that started this conversation um, many years ago, and then because I left, it kind of fell. They actually provided, I think it was a pretty lengthy list of different ratios that could be used. It's just about anything that they can calculate and then compare. So I think that would be a good resource and less strain. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's certainly something we include in the RFP, and we'll see what what they would recommend as metrics or ratios that yeah. would be relevant. You know, and, and I'm not talking about month to month stuff. I'm talking, you know, uh, half year to half year or year to year over year type of analysis that shows what the trend is. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I everyone I think has sort of reflected on the four or five months of intense budget and and and. I, a question that I had that came out of it, Tom, was whether, uh, because I regret that we haven't looked for efficiencies through the budget analyst or the purchasing agent positions, and, and uh, I was wondering whether those have ever been uh, susceptible of uh, being shared between the school and the town municipality. Sure. So as to be able to afford it, but and maybe get the big bucks or big bang that might come. And I think both positions would have cross the board appeal and mm -hmm. an application. Was that purchasing agent shared before? No, well, not not really. We we tried to make some inroads on the school side and, and just uh, weren't successful. Okay. Because we'd be getting a because this would be a good job. I mean, this would be a job. You know, Town of Scarborough's well-respected community and mm -hmm. uh, fairly large, and so when you combine, we got a $73 million budget that you'd be charged with doing analysis on or purchasing, mm -hmm. finding purchasing efficiencies on. So I would think the, it'd be capable of finding some people who knew their way around these areas, save us some money. I think both positions could have, would have um, widespread application across the organization, for sure. I, it just seemed like it might be worth at least broaching the subject with uh, uh, Dr. Anwistle for just to see whether there's any interest in carrying on the discussion, and then we ourselves could yeah. kind of weigh in because we're going to have joint finance committee meetings, mm -hmm. and I'm sure they're always looking to be more efficient themselves. So. 
We'll see if we can advance one or both of those as soon as next year. Yeah, that's a that shared thing. model. Actually, you had, do I remember right? That was actually touched on it this year too, didn't you? As kind of the wish list of yeah. things, oh. things to consider. Yes. So. It's great and I just remember it because when we were talking priorities, you said you said to me once, I don't know whether it was in your office, or, that, well, I'd, why not this one? Because here's where we could actually save some money as opposed to one that I was touting as being perhaps more important. And yeah. I, it stuck with me. that Yeah, purchasing in particular would pay for itself and then some in yeah. terms one, of savings. Save 1%, it's $700,000. Yeah. yeah. Just pretty good ROI. Yeah, yeah, really. Just uh, purchase of fuel commodities. Yeah. Someone who knows their way around that and, and can yeah. understand those markets and save a couple of cents per gallon makes a big deal across the town and the school. Mm. And they were able to, the purchasing agent back when we had one was able to actually document how much, mm. you know, this is what the budget was, this is what the bid came in at, this is what we saved, you know, and essentially showed that they covered their salary, mm. <laughs> so it was like. Yeah. Good. Thank yep. you. So the question um, to f finish off on the legal and audit services, um, given the current calendar year has begun and we're three months into it, right? Already one quarter done. Um, it seems to me that um, this request to move this issue forward really will be impacting more of the next fiscal year. So um, the question I have is that. How urgent is this to get done, like in the next 30 days, or should, can we wait a couple of months before this comes, you know, give them a little time to do the full analysis and so forth. Is that okay to you folks? Yeah, because we're, we're right, we're in audit season right, right now. So. That's why I, that's, <laughs> I was thinking of that exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right, so if you can put that on the calendar for uh, probably September, well, no, definitely September, if not late September, if not October, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Yep. Yeah, or maybe, or maybe just kind of work back when it does need to come back, because I RFP processes are usually pretty long. So if we yeah. do want it for yeah, the next true. physical year, right? Because we have an auditor for this this yeah. fiscal, right. I don't yeah. know, for 2015. Right. So what we're really looking for is an audit right. services for the 2016. But but it usually takes a month to prepare. It takes them a month, month or to more to respond and then you have to do the interview That's process okay. with whoever is going to be part of the selection group and so I mean you're talking probably a six month process so that That's true. Yeah. I, I will prepare a, a bit of an overview on the, the legal side just to at least start that conversation That'd be great and if you're amenable I'd, I'd like to talk to the folks at Bernstein Shore and maybe set up a time where we can sure. meet and start to have some conversation Again, I don't think that's quite as urgent necessarily, but I'd like to do it this fall before we get immersed in other things. Sure. Um, so I just want to be cognitive also um, for uh, transparency is that if there's any issues that are confidential or sensitive regarding any existing cases, then we should be um, aware of uh, keeping that confidential. And if we have to go into executive session to discuss that, then I want people to know that we will have to do that mm -hmm. to make sure to protect um, the town. Uh, next item I have is, um, if there's nothing else regarding that, future meeting dates and times. Um, at least going through, I believe right now we are meeting, we haven't had a meeting in a while, I forgot. I want to say it's the um, second or fourth Tuesday. The second Tuesday. Sorry, Wednesday. Second, it's the second Wednesday of the month. We're a little off this month. but um, So the question I have is, um, through the summer do we want to, you know, or I should say through the next cycle, which is November, do we want to continue doing that starting in September? Mm -hmm. um, so the next meeting will be the second Wednesday of September. Is yeah. that good? At 4 o'clock. And we'll do the same thing for October and November. In yes, because uh, the election is the Tuesday, so they won't be in place. So that will be fine. Yep, so we'll do it for uh, September, October, and November. Okay. 4 o'clock, you said? 4 o'clock. Yeah, if that still works, so we can do it. Yeah, it works for me. Yeah, okay. Sean, at some point I'd like to have, I don't think we've seen financial statements in a while. So, so, so I was having, actually, yeah, so um, I was, uh, it's not on here, but I, so moving from that date, um, any questions, comments, requests from the council members, finance committee members for staff? I, I do have a request. I have a request as well for financial statements. We've been too busy with the budget to really focus on that. And now that we're one quarter in, um, maybe we could also get the um, um, fiscal year end as well, internal. Yeah, that'll be a... I mean, that's really what I'm looking at. I, I would rather see if that's okay with you. 
we need the first quarter of this new year? It's only been three months. Two months, not two even. Months. Um, I think it would be good to see the, you know, sub maybe the October meeting. I, I don't know when, is that possible? Just, I mean, because I just think because we can the, provide. the cupboards are kind of bare with the reserve monies we've applied, so it would be good to kind of know. We can provide um, September 30th statements for your October meeting. Uh, we can provide interim unaudited, not yeah. finalized, June 30th numbers. That's the September. September. That would be great. That would be great. That's good. Yeah. Um, with a balance sheet as well. Mm -hmm. That's where we see it. Um, so I'm going to cover a couple of things from the way citizens want to comment. So I've had a chance to, uh, um, this is supposed to be the summertime in which, you know, July and August we minimize the number of meetings that we have so we can at least enjoy the summer. Um, we've been very busy, obviously, with the budget, but I, just for disclosure, I have had a chance to talk to both Bill and Peter about what we would like to do over the next couple months and so as well as what are some of the agenda items. So um, to kind of recap on some of those and add anything, obviously, uh, gentlemen, if I uh, forget that. Um, one issue that we would like to explore or we need to explore is around capital projects policy. Um, and that is um, a, a dis really need to have a full discussion. That could be pretty lengthy. It's about um, how, you know, basically how are items placed into the capital budget and capital projects? Um, how are they then funded? And then the really the executive decisioning that the council should provide and the finance committee should provide regarding the terms and conditions of those items, whether it's placing it into the budget, but also the bonding, the term, um, and, and placing it at that level, and then understanding that so we can relay that information publicly as well as to the council. Um, also wanted to uh, mention, so, um, and it seems like both, both gentlemen uh, support this. I've actually taken the initiative and have reached out to a local person that is in the consulting world and does a lot of community consulting. and. and really want to have, um, I've called this up to this point, really the lessons learned discussion about the budget um, and about the process and even the referendum process. And so what I've asked uh, from, uh, his name is Jim Demesis, and I, and I do apologize for forgetting his name, and he has some contacts, but um, Jim is um, Scarborough resident. He's done a lot. It, was, it used to be on growth and services and the growth management ordinance and a few other things for town. Um, really look at, I was thinking, oh, let's do it simply by doing a survey. Survey really isn't going to capture what went wrong or what went right. It's really more about um, an attitude test. So what we're going to really hopefully sit down is put together a baseline memo that suggests um, here is one approach, and we can either add to it, subtract from it, expand, we'll do whatever we'd like. But I think you know me that I at least want something on the, on the table to have a conversation with. And really the, what I'm thinking through and that they're putting together, and they're going to synthesize better than I am saying it right now, but really it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation with everyone, with um, those key stakeholders that were participating in the process. So obviously the entire town council, and even if we start this process after the new council, two new members, as well as even on the school board, well, you know, my goal is to also include them, the ones that are leaving and don't come back, include them in the discussion because they were part of this year's process. Um, so it would be, you know, have a facilitator that does the one-on-one -on -one conversation and then have uh, really two months or two work sessions around um, their findings so that we can then um, do what I call a deep dive into um, what I think could be the root causes and the root issues around the budget process and then have everyone who is sitting at the table, and it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has to sit at the table, but maybe the council selects three or four people, the school board selects three or four people, the town including the school department can select three or four people. But in those work sessions, those people that are sitting at the table are decision makers. And they should be empowered regardless of their position. Everyone is equal. So whether it's a school board member or a town council or a citizen, their input is as equal as anyone else's. And then and the outcome is a, a list of recommendations on how we can approach this in a more um, familiar way, um, in a family way, in the sense that we have great outcomes. One of the things that um, Jim is, um, kind of enlightened me to is that this might be a process that we could get a lot of support um, regionally, if not statewide, because maybe this becomes a model in which other communities who are faced with the same dilemma can also approach this. So hopefully that, you know, with the synopsis and the case study um, and then the capstone or however it's going to happen, it might be something that may, Mar uh, may maritime, may municipal association or um, 
Muskie School. The Muskie School, because I know there's a contact that we're going to reach out to them. Some other entity might have an interest in helping us sponsor, because there will be an obvious cost to that when you bring in a facilitator that knowledgeable. So my goal is to have to the committee, hopefully by September, that memo and outline. Um, after I, you know, I'm going to give Tom a heads up so he can see it and be knowledgeable when we come to have that document as well. So I um, want you to know that uh, it's not done. Um, and we're going to do that, and we're going to make sure that we involve our partners on the school board and school finance side as well. Um, there has been um, some conversation, and I'm not sure where everyone sits, but I at least want to put it out there, um, a recommendation to consider some type of outside consultancy or outside entity that could come in and take a look at both the town and the municipal, not the budget process, but the actual budget itself and determine um, what type of efficiencies I have some personal opinion on it, but I just want to at least put it out there because I hope that there's at least a conversation jointly with the school board. Um, there's also um, some uh, consideration to include uh, stakeholder groups, and Tom and I, you and I talked about this. Um, and there's an emphasis on what is being explored. I think it was called participatory budgeting, budgeting, um, where it's not just the elected officials. It's really involving more entities within that process so that there's greater buy-in. And so it's something that we'll have um, a conversation on at a later time and then there's some uh, conversations um, now gonna, um, about really what I would consider either charter amendments or policy changes or some combination of the two so some of the um, items and I brought them a couple up myself so just as an example um, about capping the total budget you know at the beginning of the year there's an automatic cap of X I'm not gonna put in a number or why that X was derived but we did have conversations about what is the best measure for the rate of increase in our budget. Mm -hmm. um, and then really taking it from a bot, uh, from a top down, sorry, from a bottom up approach rather than a top down. And when I say top down, it's when you go out there and say, well, I need 15%. And then you start removing things rather than you start at that, whatever that cap is. And then you start adding things that you can, um, you find value in. So it kind of uh, elates, uh, you know, kind of collaborates into that whole process. Um, again, I'm not saying that we need to have it. I just want to bring it out there um, for conversation. Um, the other pieces that I wanted to emphasize with that, I, I did mention in the council meeting about changes um, regarding um, our budget process, and I know we've talked about this, Peter, you and I, specifically, is whether or not there needs to be a charter amendment change to our budget, I'm sorry, to our fiscal year end, so that our fiscal year end aligns with the state so that we know exactly what we are getting from the state in advance of having to budget for a fiscal year, rather than this backwards, and I'm being polite because there is a word before that, um, this backwards approach of you know winging it because we have no idea what we're getting from the, from the state and then going through this process because it exasperated the entire, the entire thing. So um, that's something that I would like to explore. Keep in mind what that means is that you'll have to do a short, either a short-term budget of six months or a longer-term budget of 18 to get through that cycle. Because, because we're six months off from the state. So there's implications with that that uh, people get excited about. So um, you were talking about changing the fiscal year end from June 30 to December 31. December, which would require a charter amendment change. So I'm just saying it's, it's been brought forward. It was something that was discussed as part of this past year. I want to put it on the table because with November coming up, if it's something that the citizens want us to address, a charter amendment has to be part of the November I would think it would need to be part of November, not June, um, either this year or next year, but it's something that should be put on the table. Yeah, you'd actually need to right. form a charter commission. Uh, council can't put charter mat matters out itself. There has to be a commission uh, that works through the issues first. Right. Yeah. So we'll, ex we'll explore that. Okay. Um, um, just as the other item, by the way, that I did exp uh, mention at the last, it wasn't about that one, it was actually about the schools, and my comment to that uh, around that was, about um, getting state law changed so that um, um, the school budget not having to be approved by the town every year. And what I found out is that that is actually, um, state law actually reads that municipalities like Scarborough actually vote on continuing that process every three years. And next year is the year in which we determine whether or not we want to keep it or whether we want to change it. Um, so that's an item that could be on the table as well. Um, there's also the issue of contributions policy. November of 2016. Probably, I would think. Is that, okay. is that when that's up? She said next year, so I'm assuming that yeah, was... Yeah, it would, no it would be a secondary, secondary question as part of the validation process next year, 16. 
Oh, it would be part of the validation. Okay. Um, so then there's. The, I think we've done it. it yeah, coincident with the uh, validation vote itself. Yeah. Okay. The other item is uh, contributions policy. I know rules and policy is considering that now. Eventually that will need to come to us so that we can then um, talk about how we're going to allocate the $60,000 that was budgeted this year. Um, once the council obviously approves any changes to the policy, but we'll need to take that up as well. And then the last thing is, um, I, th I know uh, Bill, you've mentioned it y'all are already, but the other issue is about how do we future plan some of these positions that we're finding almost necessary such as, such as a budget analyst or the purchasing agent, things that are going to save the town money. So those are what I extracted from our conversations to put on the table. I'm sure if there's more or less than you'll tell me or Tom. John, I had yes. two, two, I think, or at least we touched upon. One is, and, and you, we talked about it, is some type of strategic planning process by which we can look down the road and see when big capital projects are going to come online or debt service is retired. I mean, there's been talk of a new public safety building. There is now talk of doing something with some of the elementary schools. Um, so that would be good to kind of be able to see when that might be hitting. So just that strategic planning. And the other thing I'd, I'd add is part of that stakeholder group you referenced or some process, it would be really great if we could all agree on what it is we want to measure, what are, what are the metrics that we want to use to either measure the outcomes of our, our school process or whatever. But everybody was using different things this year, so I think it would be really important if we can agree on what our, what our goals are for education, for the town, whatever that is. It would be great to be able to all agree on what our metrics are, what our benchmarks are, and make sure every dollar we're spending is driving toward those outcomes. I think it would be a much easier way for us to drive decision making. Because then we can ask, are the dollars we're spending going to achieve these metrics? If they're not, they become less important than the dollars that we can spend that will drive them. So, Just on the point of strategic planning, uh, I, I, I think what I heard you say, I would refer to it as long-range facility planning. Mm -hmm. We do have that process underway. It's currently at the staff level, but soon we'll be ready for your review and input. Good. So we're Great. going to have that deliverable within the next two months. Right. What's the span of the, of the plan? Five, 10, 15 years? What is it? Uh, we haven't determined that piece yet. Okay. We've identified the projects. Uh, <coughs> the next goal, and we actually have uh, a consultant that's helped us cost out based on cost per square foot and those sorts of things. The next one is a financial analysis to understand where are we going to shed debt in the future and right. where might is kind of the pecking order of the prioritization. Right. Right. Uh, it, it will likely span uh, probably as much as 20 years, frankly. Okay. okay. But I think that um, aligned with that, that can be tied into the strategic piece that Peter's talking about, which is going to require all 14 of us to get together, school board and town council because there's metrics that we're going to be selecting that measures the school department's performance and there needs to be buy-in from them. And they need to participate on our side because they are a subset of our budgeting or, you know, the municipal budget as a whole. So um, I'll take that. And, Tom, let's talk about how Please. we can and then yep. we'll facilitate that as part of the, the maybe yep. the first joint meeting we have with sure. the finance committee on this, uh, uh, with, the, with the school department. Sure. Bill, anything? No. We do have one housekeeping matter we'd like to put on in the next meeting or two. It's, sure. uh, it would be rescinding f former bond orders. Councils through the years have approved um, bonds, and for one reason or another, we've either not needed uh, or there's a balance unspent. And we continue to carry those in the books, and we need council action to – they're just no longer needed, sure. but we need your action to consider them. Uh, there's also a smaller group where actually bond proceeds have been, um, we have them, but we don't need them, so they need to be reassigned, whether it's toward debt service or another capital project. But again, that requires council action. So, so um, can I ask at the September meeting that the capital projects policy, um, and because and, by the way, I, when I mentioned that earlier, it was about the bonds, and so the rescinding piece I think is a nice tie into that. If we can cover those two at the September meeting, that could be our big topic item. Do you want the capital um, budget policy as yes. well? Yes. Everything related to capital, whether it's uh, projects, initiatives, or investments, however we're – and I believe we're also talking about um, school as well as part of that. You had mentioned that, right? Because it is something that we approve and it's not approved by the – sorry, we approve it and it's not approved by the citizens as part of the 
vote a referendum. <coughs> so I think that should get the same <coughs> attention. Mm -hmm. If you're in agreement, Bill, mm -hmm. I know you are. They also have a facilities group, or they yeah. do. So they yeah. I mean, because we have to tie those together, and there's never been really, I think, a strong attempt to tie anything together in this community when it relates to schools and the municipal when it comes to planning. So I think that whether it's fiscal or whether it's actual projects, I think we need to do that. I mean, to, to a significant extent. Um, so yeah, that would be that would be great because I consider those two in the same. Anything no. else for no. you or no. anything for you, Tom? Any comments? I'd like to have our com if we have any general comments um, before we open this up to the public. That way they can comment on us too, as long as they're nice. So nothing. <laughs> nothing. Great. Um, public comment before we adjourn. I didn't come here for this. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> We expected it. Larry Harwell, my period of time. Just commenting on this new struct for the one you just mentioned, Sean, about uh, the budget process and having a little like, layer to it. Um, yeah, this is the first I've heard of that. I haven't really had a chance to think too much. Think it's really like a, <coughs> a third of the budget is on the town side, approximately two thirds is on the, on the school side. Downside, as far as using this this group to, to analyze everything, we have a history of having budgets around three percent, two percent, or one percent on, on the town side. So it seems like the numbers suggest that we've been doing a good job of managing our, our costs over the years. There, so uh, right now it's like I don't know, I'm not seeing the value of that. So that's Thank you. Anything else, gentlemen, ladies? No? Um, with that, uh, it's, uh, for the record, it's 5.06 p.m. Uh, motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. All in favor, student unanimous. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Can you look at